Well, I, first of all, I want to thank you for, for investing your time. I, I know that you, uh, you're busy and you have a rigorous practice and, and teaching and lots of things going on. So I, I, I sincerely appreciate uh, the time. Um, and I have so many things that I uh, wanted to talk to you about or ask you about. Um, one of the first ones, if, if, I, if I can, most architects, designers, people that I speak to or have spoken to, where they practice or where their firm or studio or office is, is rarely where they were actually born and raised and from. Most have migrated from either east to west or west to east or Europe to here. It seems like a fairly normal type of thing in, in most cases. And I believe you have basically born and raised in Southern California and have built, is that, what's that like for you having um, really watched a city or a region evolve and, and grow over time? Well, um, it's interesting. I, I grew up in a very small town um, near the desert area, close to Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And I moved into Los Angeles to go to design school and, you know, have been here since. So I've been here since the, the 60s. And, you know, Los Angeles was a really quiet town when I got here. Um, compared to where I grew up, it was a metropolis. But, you know, um, compared to New York and other major metropolitan cities, it was rather quiet. And, you know, the city has changed tremendously over the decades. And it's become sort of the gateway to the East. And um, it's it's been very... I feel very fortunate to have um, established myself here. Los Angeles um, and Southern California particularly is a wonderful environment for business um, and opportunities. So I, I'm very, very pleased that I uh, settled here. And I, I think it's, it's just quite normal in any, in any uh, city and, and, I came from a uh, from a real estate planning uh, background mm -hmm. before Urban Bonfire. I worked for uh, about seven years in very complicated mixed use real estate planning and development. And one of my mentors, I remember saying that if a city is well built and well designed, it actually never stops evolving. There's always a neighborhood that is in transition, progression, whether you look at, for example, you know, Manhattan, uh, what the meatpacking district was 20 years ago and what mm -hmm. it is today. Like, uh, and, and, and interestingly, I remember um, when I was in my early 20s, I got my first, I bought a condo on the eastern part of, of Montreal uh, called mm -hmm. the Plateau, a really fun neighborhood. And my grandparents, who had been European immigrants here, who had lived in that area, like five people in an apartment when they first came to Canada, had worked their tails off to move to the sort of west part of the city. And when I said I was moving there, they said, you know, we worked our whole lives to move out and you're moving back right, because right. the neighborhood was in that idea right. of- It evolved. LA is so big and there are so many different neighborhoods, topographies, microclimates, what have you seen in Los Angeles or greater Los Angeles's architecture design uh, story or history in, in, in the time you've been working there? I think, um, you know, it, it's probably very much like most other cities, but Los Angeles is kind of unique in that it's not really a city. We do have a downtown, but it's a, it's a collection of suburbs. And, you know, the, all these different areas, like my office is in the West Hollywood area. And that was sort of a sleepy little bedroom community next to wedge between Beverly Hills and LA and Hollywood. And today it's a very vibrant community. A lot of young people, young families starting out. Um, you know, Beverly Hills is, is grown to be an internationally recognized city. I lived for many years in Santa Monica near the ocean. I just love that. And I remember when I first moved there, people said, why did you move out to Santa Monica? It's so far away. Well, it was 20 minutes away. Hmm. Um, today with traffic, it's more like an hour, but um, it was wonderful to be, to be by the beach. So, you know, the, the great thing about LA is you can be in whatever area you wanna settle. There's, it, they all have such distinct 
um, and different characters. Um, whether you're living downtown, whether you're living at the beach in Venice, Malibu. So, and, and the city just goes forever. So it's, it's a very fascinating place to live. And as far as design goes, you know, um, I know my brother always, uh, when he's here, he goes, you know, this city doesn't understand good architecture because LA has a little bit of everything. And, um, you know, it's, we, we have uh, architecture from the 30s and 40s. We have the city developed in the 50s and the 60s. We have modern architecture. And Los Angeles doesn't really have a style. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a home in Santa Barbara. And one of the things I love about um, that area is that it has a distinctive look and it has a distinctive feel. Um, Los Angeles doesn't. But, um, you know, I had a, a friend who used to live in Rome and he was studying urban planning. And I had met him many years ago and then I ran into him at a cocktail party. And I said, what are you doing in Los Angeles? And he said, he's um, working in urban planning and architecture. And I said, wow, you left one of the great cities in the world to move to LA where <laughs> it's sort of known for non-architecture. And he goes, are you kidding? He said, the great thing about LA is I can create anything I want. In Rome, it's a city that's established. Everything is historical. I can't touch anything. He said, whatever my mind wants to create, I can do here in Los Angeles. The opportunity exists. So I think if you're a creative person and you're in the design industry, whether it's interior design, architecture, landscaping, whatever, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really wonderful place because of the opportunity to do whatever you, wherever your mind takes you. And I, I, I was going to actually ask you, you answered the question before I asked it. And, and I guess the conclusion or what I think the message is, is if someone is prepared to be creative and take risk and, and explore and not necessarily stay within the confines or the, the traditional lines, if you will, of this is this style of home that this neighborhood of the city is always used and we don't go outside of those lines. For the visionaries, it provides an almost limitless canvas to, yes. yeah. to, to work with. Right. Yeah, we're the home of, you know, this is the um, center for the entertainment industry. Um, we have a tech community here. I mean, there's just all sorts of businesses here. So I think mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a very healthy mix of people. Um, I didn't have that where I grew up. It was a very small sort of restrictive community. And to move into LA where I, where it was so multicultural, where I could decide if I want to go out to dinner tonight, I could have Greek food, Mexican food, you know, Italian food, whatever, whatever I wanted. So I think that's one of the thing that makes um, Los Angeles so attractive. So as someone who is based there and, and, and what we've just described, those fundamentals, I know you also do project work, work across uh, the U.S. And, and, and around the world. When you go to a city or a neighborhood or an environment that has more, let's call it, um, whether it is uh, government imposed or, or social norms imposed, but where there are more, let's call it design restriction, what does that do to your process when you are faced with slightly more limitations potentially than you would have in, in Los Angeles or, or in California? I don't know. I, I don't, I have really never found that a problem. Um, the, um, you know, we're, we're working, we're currently working on um, a couple projects in Nantucket and these are historical restorations and they're in the historical district. And um, I've worked there for many, many years. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're very, um, there are a lot of rules as to what you can and cannot do. And with historical structures, you have to, they wanna retain the integrity. And um, we're very respectful of that. Actually, I, I love that because I, I admire and respect what they have accomplished. And when you go to some place like Nantucket, you realize it's a real treasure. And the, real, the reason it's a treasure is because they've been able to control development. So having to work within those confines is really not restrictive at all. And it just makes you be more creative is all. So 
And, and it's the same, you know, if you're working on um, a, a plane or a ship or mm -hmm. um, a house abroad in another city, there are rules and regulations in those industries that control how and what we design. So we, we work within those confines and, and develop something that is suitable. Mm -hmm. Well, then I guess to that point, as someone who, who in, a, in a very, uh, in a very self claimed way can creatively adapt to scenarios and see those as, as, as positives and joyous versus as hindrances. Uh, you mentioned Rome a few minutes ago, and I know you're of uh, Italian descent. And I, I, with how long you've been doing this for and, and watching the evolution of, of cities, neighborhoods, clients, um, design techniques and styles, at this point, what, where do you go or where do you seek out inspiration or where does inspiration find you? Oh, I'm, you know, probably, um, I, I teach a class at UCLA and I always talk to the yeah. students about um, in, inspiration, what inspires you and how, how to get motivated, inspired. For mm -hmm. myself, I, I've always enjoyed looking at what other designers, architects, landscapers do, um, and thinking, you know, that um, looking at somebody's work who I admire, and and then also traveling. I think traveling is probably the biggest inspiration for me because Huge. I have been fortunate to travel around the world um, with clients on my own, whether it's for business or pleasure, and I love looking at, it's, it's not just looking at design and architecture. I love experiencing the lifestyles. I love, you know, um, looking at the clothing. I love eating the food. I love smelling the food. I love looking at the landscape, the monuments, everything about the lifestyle and culture. And I think it's thing, something that you just soak in. And I love when I go to a new place or if it's repeated to just immerse myself into wherever I am. And, you know, then I, I use these as resources so that when I'm doing a project, I can think, gee, I, I was just in Positano last year and I thought, mm -hmm. I remember staying at, at um, this villa and there were some architectural details that we're using on a project here in the garden, in, in the pool area, in the loggia in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. So um, I find traveling extremely, um, exciting and inspirational, probably the number one thing. As, as I, I completely agree. And I think that there is nothing, there's nothing more inspirational, whether it's, um, whether it's subconscious and it, you, you know, you draw on it at a time of creative reflection or you actually take note of it or, or today, you know, uh, so easy to take pictures where in the past that was a more of a challenging thing, but I completely, completely agree. Where, where is your, where do you love to travel? Well, I mean, I know uh, we can't right now, but right when now. this opens up, where, where would you like to go? Well, I'll share with you at this point in my life, some of my absolute favorite places that I have uh, been to um, where I, um, so one is uh, Nosara, Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. A small town called Guiones. It's where I got married. Uh, it's where it, it is my special place. And uh, outside of COVID, I've tried to go with my wife and children almost every year. Uh, it just feels amazing to be there. Mm -hmm. There's something about the the air, the soil, the food, the the up early, down early with the sun. It's 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 wonderful. Um, I have spent a lot of time in um, in Israel and mm -hmm. looking at the balance of uh, you know modern and very very uh, traditional and restrictive. You know, for example, you mentioned earlier the city of Jerusalem. All facades must be made out of a specific Jerusalem stone. You mm -hmm. cannot waver from that material within. So, an example of a of a design you know restriction that is mm -hmm. that is worked with, and then. I absolutely adore, um, I adore Northern California. I, I, I was able to live for a year and a half in Carmel and spent an That's amazing so amount of, it was 
perfect. I mean, it was the ability to spend, you know, Sundays in Big Sur and Saturday afternoons in the Carmel Valley and, and be able to spend an hour and a half and be, you know, in downtown San Francisco. It mm-hmm. was, it was literal perfection for yes. me. Yeah. The Northern California clo- coast is, is pretty great. I, and, and, but I've lived in Africa. I lived in Tanzania for almost four months in, in my life and things like that. So, and what about you? What are the special places in, on your, uh, on your travel list? Oh God, I, I have so many. I don't think there's any place in my life that I've traveled that I didn't absolutely love. Maybe a couple of them, but um, obviously I have a passion for Italy because I, um, I think in maybe a previous life, I must have lived during Roman times Um, because I I remember the first time I went to Rome, um, I had just bought a new pair of like tennis shoes or walking shoes and I put on my jeans and a leather jacket and my new shoes and I walked, I must have walked a hundred miles and I finally had to stop because I had to meet some friends for dinner, but I just couldn't soak it in and it all felt so familiar to me. And um, I just was mesmerized by the architecture and the people were so lovely. And, you know, and the, every restaurant that you'd go by was so exciting. So I do love traveling to Italy. And they're just, there's so many fascinating parts of Italy that are so um, different, you know, whether you're in Sicily or Naples, Herculaneum, Venice, Genoa. And um, I'm leaving in a couple of weeks or three weeks to go to Hawaii. And one of my favorite mm-hmm. spots there is the island of Kauai. And um, out at the North Shore, it's, um, it's really a very magical and a spiritual place. When you're there, um, you feel the energy. It's, um, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's very, very special. And everything there is green. It's one of the rainiest spots on the planet. So everything is lush and green. Wow. And, um, you know, you just get, you get high from breathing the air there. This oxygen level is so high. And, you know, so, and I'd love to go back to Vietnam. I had a very fascinating trip to Vietnam several years ago. And I'd like to go back and explore Southeast Asia more. So I don't know, there's just a million places I'd like to go. I've got to go sometime in the next uh, three or four months when things become a little more open. I have to go to London and Paris on business. So, Mm -hmm. and those are always so much fun to visit. Uh, tr- absolutely true. A uh, question for you with all the cities and places that you've named, has Montreal ever, uh, have you ever visited, Mon- have you visited Montreal? No, you know, I, I, I feel badly because I, I know nothing about Montreal. I've always mm-hmm. wanted to go because everybody says it's such a beautiful city. It is. And um, I have friends in, in Canada, they're in the Kamloops area. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it, it is on my list um, but I haven't been fortunate enough to visit uh, your. Well, when you do, there. when you do, uh, it's a pretty amazing. I mean, you can take off at LAX and land in Montreal in five hours, and it it will feel extremely European in terms of mm-hmm. its scale, its 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 architecture and design, its density. It, it will feel very, very much like in certain mm-hmm. neighborhoods, uh, the types of Parisian or, or or Italian neighborhoods with cobblestone and winding streets and beautiful Mm -hmm. historically designed facade work. I just, if you ever make it, it would be my greatest honor to give you a, you know, a a highlight of a little walking tour of some of my favorites. So I'd love that be a great honor. Um, I want to come back because a couple moments ago in uh, inadvertently probably mentioning the feeling of Hawaii with the air and the, the, the fact that it is green and lush and that out feeling of being outdoors. And I, I want to segue that into talking a little bit about um, the role of outdoor space in your projects, mm-hmm. uh, past, present, and maybe future. Um, and, and first to get a sense of there's obviously through COVID being an, uh, uh, um, an accelerator, there's been a major focus on outdoor space activation in the last 10 years. Yes. Um, and 
I'd love to get your thoughts or your perspective on someone, first of all, who, you know, has developed his practice in California, where you have some of the nicest weather available to outdoor space. Um, but I'd like to understand from you the bit of the story on the role of outdoors in your client's expectations, its importance and significance to both the client and to you. I'd love to understand the, the relationship or the role with outdoor uh, in, in you in, in your practice? Oh, well, uh, Brian, this is a great question. Uh, and it's a favorite topic of mine because um, I think this is one of the my favorite aspects of what I do is working with landscape architects and the architects and to create a seamless project where the outside and the inside work so beautifully together. Because as you said, in this climate, the outdoors is an outdoor living is just as important as indoor living. Yeah. And for me, it's more important because I love being, I'm outdoors every moment I can, I can be. So um, we, what we try and do is it, every project is unique and different because it depends on the location. You know, for instance, I did a, a home in Malibu for one of my dearest friends and, you know, we designed this house from the ground up. It's a very modern sort of cutting edge contemporary with stainless steel panels and so forth. It's right on the ocean. And so the ocean, you were talking about limitations. There's certain materials and things that we are, have to use because of its exposure to the salt air and so forth. Sure. But there's a very small garden there. And again, because of the salt air, it makes you... Um, choose the proper plantings and so forth that are going to live in that environment. But mm -hmm. they have an outdoor living space that's right on the ocean. So you design around that. Um, you know, we did a project in Santa Inez, which is the wine country north of Santa Barbara. And we completed this project just uh, three or four years ago. And it was such an exciting project to work on because the, the house, um, is set in about 150 acres of vineyards. And the setting is just idyllic. You're, you're surrounded by the beautiful San Inez Mountains. You have incredible sunrises, spectacular sunsets that turn magenta and orange and blue skies. And then you look out over the countryside and you see fields, just acres of vineyards, and then the mountains in the distance. So um, in designing this place, the house was, sort of a, uh, a very unexciting, um, ordinary house. And we took the house, and this was a five-year project, and we redeveloped the house and created something very special and unique for the client. And in designing it, every room, every single room in the house opens to an outdoor loggia, patio, garden, pool area, whatever. And you have every room has a vista, whether it's a mountain view or the lake view um, or the vineyards. And um, so when I'm in a room like that, to me, looking outdoors, that becomes the art. That's like a fine painting. And, you know, it's, it's always evolving. It's always changing. So when I completed this project a few years ago, I just recently visited it and it has a completely different feeling because the gardens have evolved. And my dear friend Puck, I was fortunate to work with her. Um, she did the landscaping. And we were always consulting with one another, what's going in this room? What are you gonna be facing? What types of things should I do outside? So it was very collaborative. And of course the client was involved also very involved. So um, it's always exciting to be able to develop spaces for outdoor living. You know, on the lower level is a, a very expansive wine cellar. And at the end of the wine cellar, these two 12 foot doors open into a terrace and you open these doors and you look out over the vineyards and the mountains beyond. But on the terrace, we have two fireplaces, a pizza oven, a fountain, mm -hmm. um, a sitting area and a dining area so um, that it can be used for entertaining. And they use this area extensively. So around this house are probably, I don't know, five, six, seven different um, patio areas for 
lounging and relaxing and dining at different times of the day and depending upon the weather conditions. So it's, it's just a lot of fun to be able to create and suggest things to a client and, and see the client get so enthusiastic and so involved in it. And to see them actually use the house the way it was intended to use, be used. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I don't know, would, did that answer your question? It, it does because, you know, it, it, it does. And, and the connectivity factor is really the, the part of it that I, I want to explore the most because, well, you just described this uh, idea that I'm almost like, as you were talking, my head was going to the movie Sideways and just trying to, I imagine, which was set in that Santa Barbara wine region very similar topography and i remember the beautiful sunsets in the hills uh, and that's on that large scale what i'm interested or what i'm extremely passionate about is the the need for or the or the the um the relevance of outdoor design in smaller urban footprints and with this worldwide move into urbanity where the the deck the roof the balcony the, yes. the small yard um is being looked at with the same level of interest in terms of room creation or experience creation um as often an indoor room is and it doesn't take huge amounts of space no. to create that and that's what's really fascinating to me. And I learned this over time of, of you know, going to people's houses at the early parts of, of, of our business and being for the first part of the discussion in the indoor kitchen and mm -hmm. seeing the thought, the investment, the detail that had gone into it, and then taking five or six steps and going through a glass door into complete disconnect no thought, no time, no investment, just a rusty old barbecue and a, and a plastic table. And, and bridging that disconnect has really been my mission. Yeah, that doesn't sound terribly um, appealing to me, <laughs> but, but I know the rusty old barbecue. And, um, but, you know, I think, um, well, for me, I, th I think that's a thing of the past because people are passionate about the outdoor spaces today. And especially for entertaining and cooking. And, and today when we have to, I guess when, you know, being cooped up, we're developing all these spaces. So yeah. I, a friend of mine um, just purchased a house in, in Southampton on the East Coast. And um, I'm helping her uh, develop the outdoor space, exactly what you said. They, you walk outside and it's just, uninspired, it's boring, um, it's not attractive at all, and there's a rusty old barbecue. So we're creating a complete outdoor kitchen, cooking area, dining area, seating area um, for outdoor living during the, the spring and the summer months. Obviously during the winter there, it's not gonna be as, as inviting. Sure, but, sure. And you know, we're doing, we're putting in a, a, a covered sort of loggia pergola area that has heaters in it so that in the mm -hmm. evening, if it's cool, it's Great. warm. We're doing an outdoor fireplace and it has a full kitchen, barbecue, refrigerated drawers and so forth. And, you know, it's probably, I don't know, what, 100 feet or 200 feet from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. But that's where the family's going to, when we get this completed, that's where they're going to congregate most of the time. Absolutely. There's a pool. So, and then, you know, part of the whole thing is to create this magic environment so that the landscaping envelops you and you've got beautiful trees and shrubbery and, and um, you know, magical little areas to walk through in the garden. It, it sounds, it sounds perfect. And, and I'm, it's so interesting. And I'm glad that you brought up things like, you know, I, I think one of the big reasons potentially on the on the East Coast or Midwest or here in Canada or places that are more challenged in terms of seasonality and harshness yes. of climate. Mm -hmm. In the past, we would hear things like, you know, well, it's winter five months a year, so I don't know if I should do it. And over the last uh, decade, the advancement in things like pergolas, infrared heaters, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. have been so significant that they've added in certain cases an extra 
three weeks, a month, five weeks of bookends on the yes. summer. And people are getting substantially more return on investment as it relates to, to usage. Well, Ryan, I think one of the things um, is that nature, being in nature, being outdoors is very grounding. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it, it, feeds your soul. It soothes you. Um, you know, I, I'm under a lot of pressure at times. And um, the magic for me is when I go to my home in Santa Barbara, um, I just love being outdoors. I love walking out. It's two acres with hundred year old oak trees. I love the smell. I love walking around and touching them. I love pulling weeds in the garden. And it brings me, it brings me back to center. And I think today with so much pressure um, in business and life and with this last year, especially, I think people are really searching for that. They need something to soothe their soul, to get back to center. And I know for me, it's been extremely important. That is uh, not only deeply profound, but incredibly aligned with me. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, I'm a big fan of outdoor cooking. Who would start an outdoor kitchen, you know, in the, who wasn't really in love with that? So I have every grill, toy, smoker, pizza oven you could imagine. <laughs> uh, you know, I have no interest in a, in a sports car, but give me, you know, a, a, a three foot uh, griddle to make pancakes on in the morning for my kids. And I am, I'm on cloud nine. But I want to come back to your point that, you know, it, it centers you or, you know, picking weeds, which may seem like a, like who would want to do that when I'm at my country house, which is about an hour and 10 minutes North of, mm -hmm. of here, it is not uncommon, even though I have five or six barbecues up there for me to take cinder blocks and burn wood down till it's at its ember and coal and find an old, cast cast iron grate and cook there and in exactly the same way that you've just described that the the activity is very it's not the activity necessarily but it is the the ability to be focused on just that thing and its calming effect was is mm -hmm. is it really resonates with me mm. well um i'm i'm building an outdoor cooking area at my new home and I guess you're going to have to visit because I don't cook. <laughs> okay. But, well, but I, I do. I so. do have friends that love to come over and do it. So I'm good at preparing and getting all the materials and, um, and cleaning up afterwards, but I'm not a very good cook. So I love designing well, it, but cooking is not my forte. Well, you know, it would be such a pleasure and honor because it's uh, tough to travel at this point, but uh, as soon as, uh, as soon as I can, that would be, uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you, uh, that you teach and the influence on uh, young or, or just starting designers um, Beyond the technical and beyond the um, what they need to know in terms of this plus this equals that from the technical side, I think so much of the designer role is it's part sociologist, it's part psychologist, it's part mind reader, it's part uh, extractor of of you know of concepts. How do you guide your students or how do you mentor them in terms of making their practices or their their journeys? as meaningful and you know, successful as possible? Well, you know, when I started off in this business, I was uh, very naive and wasn't really exposed to a lot of design and architecture. And I was a little bit lost. I found my way very quickly because um, I'm very good at um, finding my way when I am um, don't know exactly where I'm headed, but you know, I didn't have people when I started off to ask questions. And I also felt that if I asked that it would make me look like I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was a little bit shy or leery of asking people for help. So when I um, talk to the students at UCLA, um, our, our 
breadth of subject is very wide. We talk about the business of design, how to set up a business. I talk them how to conduct themselves, how to set up bank accounts, um, how to deal with people, how to deal with problems, um, what all different aspects of the running a design business. And, um, but one of the things that I love talking to them about, I, they always wanna know, um, there's usually two questions they always are asking. How, what do I do to go out and get a job when I have no experience and somebody wants experience? That's always a question that comes up. And, um, and they wanna know how, they get, how to get started. So I talk to them about that. And then the other thing I talk about, we talked about this just a little bit earlier about inspiration and what inspires me. So I feel that it's my job to inspire them and to motivate them and to give them the help that I didn't have when I was starting out. So I, I love helping these students. I love motivating them and I love seeing them engaged and interested. So, and it's, it's extremely satisfying and rewarding. I imagine. I imagine so there, there's nothing more, uh, there's nothing more, fun and in many ways redeeming than um than sharing the journey and saving other people from you know uh, mistakes or, or or the hardships of starting and i and i think that's just uh, that's just wisdom and experience being being passed down and, right i i'm uh, always telling them about what the pitfalls are because you know we've all made them so i've made them i've learned um once i made a mistake i learned not to do it again hmm. So, and I talk to them about what to avoid, what, as well as what to do, what not to do, so. And one of the things you just mentioned is, and, and it's gonna lead me to my, the last uh, question or thing I'd love mm -hmm. to get your thoughts on. Um, you mentioned as you're showing them a collection of your work. And I wanna talk about this for a second because if you go to most uh, design architecture firms, uh, websites, Instagram, for example, in the vast majority of cases, you see beautiful finished projects, perfectly photographed, merchandised, styled, just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I remark in my time researching before today and spending time on, on your Instagram page, you have blended in a lot of personality and authenticity versus just showing the work. There's images of you, you in the middle of Zoom calls, podcasts, talking to clients, people that inspire you. It's, it's a very, um, it's a much more engaged and, 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 and journey storytelling like way of sharing with your, with your audience. And I'm curious, was that premeditated? Did that come, was that? Because it's really quite rare in, in the architecture and in the design, uh, the way people show their, their firms, their, their branding and their work. So I, well, that's it, really a, re it res I resonated. Very sad, but, um, you know, what we do, and this is what I love about um, my, my profession, is that we're given such a wonderful opportunity to work with such a variety of people. You know, over, over my career, I've had people in finance, entertainment, medicine, um, astrophysics, whatever it is. And we're exposed to areas of life and culture that if you had just a day-to-day -day job doing the same thing, you wouldn't be exposed to this. And we're, we're dealing with some really fascinating, exciting people. And, and I find that very, very motivating. So, and what we do is we don't just go in and design a house or offices or a plane for somebody. What we're doing is we're creating lifestyles and we're creating um, living environments, working environments, entertaining environments, and um, in all different aspects of it. We have clients that come to us and say, you know, we have this wonderful home now and we can entertain. I need somebody to help me plan a party, I need, I need a florist. And we provide all this information. I give them resources to go to. Mm. Um, I introduce them to people that I have met over my career. So it's, it's not just one aspect of design. It's, it's so 
multidimensional. And that's what makes our job exciting that we have so many different areas and venues to venture into. So, um, you know, I, um, I think the, the greatest compliment for me is when a job is completed and you see the client come in and, you know, they're reduced to tears. Hmm. Hopefully that's good, not because they hate it, but, of and you'll get a call from them, you know, a couple months later and say, you know, we just love our house. And I'll never forget, I did a house many years ago for a family. And when it was done, um, she called me and said, Mark, you've changed our life. I never thought just redesigning and redecorating a house was life altering. But she said, the kids were never home. They were always running around. We never were together. She said, now the family sits at the table in the dining room. We have dinner together. It's comfortable. It's warm. It's inviting. She said, all the kids, all their friends want to be over here. They all want to, they hang out in their rooms and all the kids are here. It's so wonderful. And it's, it's changed the dynamics of our family and the way we operate. Well, that's just the best thing a designer can hear that you've succeeded. And, you know, so it's not just making something pretty. We have the ability to change an, uh, people's lives and the way they function and enrich their lives. Um, and I know for me, I'm very motivated by beauty, proportion, lighting, scale, and all of these things, even if you're not aware of it, um, Ryan, your, your soul feels it. When you're in a great space that's well-designed, coordinated, and curated, you will feel it. The energy is remarkable. So um, that's what we try and accomplish. And, and I'm very flattered that you think our... Um, our social media and website reflects that. I it, like it, hearing that. It felt very real. It felt mm -hmm. very approachable. It felt mm -hmm. like, you know, it, it wasn't just the name, you know, Mark Weaver, that there was, there was real, uh, there was real roots in, 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 in principles um, sort of behind the, the, the design. Mm -hmm. And it just resonated with me as, as even looking at it as, as a consumer, it's the type of individual or firm that I would want to work with or do business with because it resonates with, uh, with, with me. So. Well, thank you. That's, that's very kind. Pleasure is mine. Mark, I, I, I have enjoyed this time really very much. I, I thank you for uh, investing your time with, uh, with me. Um, it would be such a joy to work with you uh, in the future. And whether I get to California first or, or you get to Montreal first, uh, it would be lovely to uh, have a meal together and, uh, and see each other again. I would enjoy that. And thank you very much for inviting me on um, Urban Bonfire today. This was a real treat. Um, thank you, Al. Um, thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Pleasure is mine. Enjoy your sure. weekend. Stay safe and be well. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye.